All right. Thank you, Lorena, uh, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, I'm glad to see there's so much interest in Antarctica. Um, it's a place that certainly not a lot of people actually get to experience. Um, and anytime people find out that I've been to Antarctica, uh, the first question is always, what was it like? Uh, so that is one of the things that um, I'll be talking to you about tonight, um, as well as talking about the project that I had going on down there, what it takes to actually get to Antarctica, what life is like around Antarctica, uh, and things like that. Um, I first want to start off um, and just give a thanks uh, to some of the people uh, that are involved with this project, uh, primarily Mark Seafelt, who is my collaborator at the University of Colorado. Um, the UNAVCO group uh, is another organization here in Boulder, and they were the ones that provided a lot of the support for the project. Um, a lot of what we did wouldn't have been possible without the UNAVCO group. Uh, I'm also going to call out uh, Carol Costanza with the University of Wisconsin, who was down there at the same time as we were and really helped out with a lot of the installation and stuff. Uh, and you'll see some of the pictures as we were going through that, uh, doing these installations. And finally, the National Science Foundation and really the McMurdo Station staff. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what it's like at McMurdo and how the station actually runs. Uh, but it's truly amazing to think that McMurdo is actually a station that is fully manned by NSF, uh, with people doing everything from taking care of electricity, to plumbing, to carpenters, uh, to maintaining vehicles, uh, everything like that. Uh, so a big thanks to all of those organizations who made this possible. So I want to start off um, and ask for a show of hands. Uh, how many people have ever awakened in the morning thinking that the weather was supposed to be nice because you heard it from the weatherman on TV, <laughs> and you got dressed, and you walked out the front door to this? <laughs> Nobody's ever seen this happen, right? Never. Well, there's two reasons um, I will tell you why that sort of thing happens. Um, the first is kind of a special reason that a lot of people don't actually know about. Uh, when meteorologists get their degree, we actually get a secondary degree in professional lying. <laughs> actually, that's what my mother thinks. That, that's not actually true. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons uh, that we oftentimes struggle when it comes to actual forecasts uh, we look at weather models, we have that information available to us as meteorologists, and the weather models, sometimes they nail it, sometimes they don't. Um, and one of the reasons that they don't nail it um, is primarily because sometimes we don't have a good understanding of some of the things that we're actually trying to forecast. Snowfall being one of those things. Uh, now, why measure snowfall? Um, I get this question from people a lot of time. There's two different methods for measuring snowfall. Um, there's one method that most of you are probably the most familiar with. Where you take a ruler, you go outside, you stick it in the snow, and you figure out how many inches of snow you had. If you cheat, you go over to the biggest snow depth bank and stick the ruler in there and try to beat out your neighbor saying, yeah, I got two more feet than you did. <laughs> As scientists, we're actually not as interested in snow depth. Um, really, what we're more interested in is how much water is actually frozen in those snowflakes. Uh, if you think about it, um, all of you here tonight have clearly experienced snow here in Colorado. This last snowstorm that we got, if you went out and shoveled it, the snow is pretty light, um, relatively easy to move around. As we start getting a little bit later into the spring, Snow is going to start getting wetter. We're going to start getting more into our concrete snow type of season. Um, there's going to be a lot more hospital visits from people breaking their backs, trying to shovel all the snow off of their driveway. Um, so from our perspective, when we're actually looking at snowfall amounts, we want to know how much snow is tied up in there. Because for water budgets, uh, for knowing how much water we're going to have available for drinking water and stuff like that, we want to know how much water is actually tied up in that snow. So snow depth to us actually isn't important. What we're really interested in is what we call the liquid water equivalent, which is just a fancy term for how much water is actually in the snow. So before we get into the whole Antarctic project, I want to talk a little bit about snowfall measurement basics um, and give you a little bit better understanding of what it is that we do for snowfall, how we do it, uh, because this will be my lead in then to tell you how it was that I actually was able to go down to Antarctica. Rain falls at approximately 30 feet per second. Um, it's a lot more dense than snow. It's a lot harder for rain to blow around, unless you're in a hurricane. Snow, on the other hand, falls at 3 feet per second, um, a factor lower uh, than rainfall measurement is. Um, and because of that, it's obviously a lot more easily influenced by wind. Uh, the stronger the winds, the more horizontal the snow is going to blow, the harder it is to actually capture the snow. Um, so. 
How do we actually capture the snow? One of the primary things that we have been using over the years um, on many of our projects is the Ott Hydromet Pluvio 2 gauge. Um, sounds very fancy. I've got one right up here um, in front of the podium, so, uh, so you can actually get a true idea of what the size of one of these looks like. Uh, the idea behind this is actually very simple. There's a bucket inside, which you can see over on the right-hand side. Um, so the snow will fall into the bucket, and underneath the bucket is really just a mass balance. Uh, so the bucket sits on top of that, and as snow accumulates inside of the bucket, uh, the amount of weight on the mass balance goes up, and we can directly determine how much liquid water is actually falling in the bucket. Seems relatively straightforward. Um, these gauges have been around for a little while now. Um, they're very precise. They're very sensitive. Uh, these particular gauges can actually measure down to four one thousandth of an inch. Uh, so very tiny, very small measurements um, that we're talking about. So that's good. We've got these precipitation gauges. We can stick them out there. We can try to measure snow. But one of the problems is wind, as I had just talked about. Wind, of course, is going to come along with a horizontal component to it. And as soon as it hits that gauge, we're going to get a little bit of an updraft that goes over that gauge. So if it's snowing and we have a snowflake that comes down, that snowflake <laughs> is going to get caught in our updraft. And it's not going to fall in our precipitation gauge, which creates a problem. So we have to come up with some unique ways in which we can actually improve snowfall measurements and get the snow to fall in the gauge like it's supposed to. There's all different methods that have been developed for shielding different types of precipitation gauges. Um, the fence that you see down here is uh, one of these methods. Um, I'll also point out that the pictures and stuff that you're seeing in this pre presentation, almost all of them are mine. Um, I've got credits to the other people on here if I've uh, borrowed things from other people. Uh, and this is actually from one of our Antarctic sites. This is one of the snow gauge shielding things that we set up. The idea behind putting shields and stuff around these gauges is we want to slow the wind down enough so that the vertical component of the snowflake can take over at that point, and the snowflake will actually fall inside of the gauge. Now, there's all different types of techniques and all different measurement methods for doing this. For example, the altar shield is one of the most common types of shields used around precipitation gauges. In the US, uh, Canada uses them a lot too. Uh, you'll see them in various other countries. Uh, it's a circular shield. It measures about four feet in diameter. And as the wind speed increases, the fins on the shield blow in more and more, uh, which helps slow the wind down and deflect the snowfall particles so that they will actually fall inside of the gauge. This shield has been around uh, for about 80 years now. It was developed by a guy named Alter uh, back in the 30s. Um, we at NCAR actually kind of built on this design over the years. And we came up with the initial double Alter design, where we had the single Alter gauge uh, I'm sorry, the single altar shield that went around the precipitation gauge. And we took a second one, measuring about eight feet in diameter, and put it around the outside of that. Uh, a company called Belfort Instrument uh, came along after us. Um, they did some computational fluid dynamic modeling, uh, which is a fancy way of saying they built some computer models to test airflow as it went around the various different shields. And they actually came up with a modified design from the one that we had. Uh, which we refer to as the Belfort double altar shield. Uh, and this is the one that we actually ended up deploying in Antarctica uh, for most of our sites. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that, why we, we chose this particular type of shielding to put around the precipitation gauges. Uh, the last one that I want to talk about is what we call the DFIR shield, or the double fenced intercomparison reference. Uh, this was actually a Russian design. Um, I'm not sure when the Russians came up with this, uh, but this is actually considered the standard for snowfall measurement. Uh, if we want to go out and do snowfall measurement, we can do comparisons of gauges in different shields to a gauge inside a DFIR, and we can come up with uh, comparisons to see how well they're doing. Uh, this particular shield um, was based off of another shield called the Bush Shield, uh, which was literally just circular bushes. Uh, that were put around precipitation gauges. And they found that this shield actually worked fairly well in comparison to the Bush shield. But this shield, unlike the other ones, is actually 40 feet in diameter. So you can start to tell that depending on where you are, depending on where you're putting precipitation gauges, 
an unsightly 40-foot gauge may not necessarily be the type of thing that you want to put in your backyard if you're trying to do accurate snowfall measurements. So now we've come up with these different types of shields and stuff that we've put around the gauges. So now when we get wind that comes along, it's going to hit the shields. The wind is actually going to act to slow the shields. And now, when it starts snowing, we're, our snowflake is actually going to fall inside of the gauge, like it's supposed to, mostly. So different shields, different applications. Like I said, the DFIR shield is huge. It's 40 feet in diameter. Um, it's not something that you're necessarily going to put in every location. Uh, we put one in Antarctica um, of the four sites that we set up. And just putting that shield up by itself took us nearly two days, um, which was not an option for visiting all of the sites. Um, so a lot of the questions I get then is, OK, so you've got this precipitation gauge. You've developed all these different types of shields and stuff that go around these gauges. What happens in an actual precipitation event? What does it look like? What, do you get, what data do you get from these gauges? So let me show you some plots. Um, here's an example precipitation event. So a lot of the research that we've done for snowfall measurement uh, that we've built on for Antarctica has been done at a test site just south of Boulder here um, at a site called Marshall. Uh, it is kind of behind where the Costco sits off of US 36, for those of you that are familiar with the area. Uh, and we've been doing snowfall measurement now for 20, 25 years, trying to address the question of what is the best way for doing accurate snowfall measurement. Uh, so a lot of uh, what we've done has been built on the DFIR. Uh, we have eight DFIR shields at this site. We probably have another uh, four or five single altar shields and another four or five double altar shields, along with some other types of designs and stuff that have been tested over the years that aren't quite as good and not quite as popular. So this is from a precipitation event back in 2014 uh, that we had here in Boulder. So the, the lighter gray color is the wind speed, uh, which is depicted um, over on the uh, right-hand side. And on the uh, left-hand side is the precipitation accumulation. So the dark black line is the accumulation amount that the gauge and the DFIR shield showed for this particular event, which was somewhere in the order of 16 to 17 millimeters. I'm sorry, 16, yeah, 16 to 17 millimeters. If you put a precipitation gauge out, and you don't put any type of shielding around it. That's what that particular um, gauge showed. So instead of getting 16 to 17 millimeters, we were actually getting on the order of 11 millimeters, roughly a third less of what actually fell. If you put an altar shield around your precipitation gauge, it's better than not shielding it, but still not quite as good as if you had a DFIR shield. The Belfort double altar shield that we settled on uh, for use in Antarctica during that time was very close. Um, it almost came in at matching the DFIR. Um, it was maybe a millimeter or two lower than that. So going from a 40-foot diameter shield down to an 8-foot diameter shield meant that we lo lost only one or two millimeters was a significant improvement. Also, one other thing that I want to point out on these plots um, obviously, with wind speed, as things are changing, you notice how these lines start to diverge, and you get different amounts in the end. You'll notice they start diverging right about the point here. Everything was matching up early on before that because it was actually rain. And at this point here, it switched over to snow. So using these shield combinations, obviously we won't be able to do this in Antarctica since it doesn't rain in Antarctica, uh, but a lot of people can use combinations like this kind of as a precipitation type discriminator. And you can get an idea of when it's going from rain over to snow. So now that we have the DFIR, we've established that as our standard. We can come up with a correction for the Belfort double altar. The WMO SPICE project that Lorena alluded to earlier um, was a project where we really wanted to establish a world standard for snowfall measurement. Every country up to this point has kind of been doing their own thing for snowfall measurement. Some people use the altar shield. Some people use a DFIR. Some people use the bush. Some people use all different types of shields. There was really no set standard. Uh, so the, the WMO SPICE project was really a collaboration between 18, 18 to 20 different countries, uh, where each country 
set up a standard set of instruments and then ran these comparisons at all the different sites and then all the data was combined together um, and we established what our world standard was going to be. Uh, and for the most part, everybody agreed that the DFIR was going to be the world standard for snowfall measurement. Now, one of the things that they did not have as they were doing this project was a site that can get really, really cold and really, really windy, which is kind of where Antarctica starts to come in. So one of the things that we wanted to do was take what we've learned here and actually go down to Antarctica and see if these corrections and stuff that we've established thus far actually hold for really cold, really windy conditions. So that brings me to the segment where now we're going to Antarctica. So how do we get there? Well, we had to put in a proposal to the National Science Foundation. Uh, so myself and Mark Seafelt uh, got together and said, all right, uh, we think the technology is to the point nowadays where we can actually do snowfall measurement down there. At this point in time, and this is still kind of true, attempts have been made by people to do snowfall measurement down there, but most of them have found that it's too cold, it's too windy, instruments generally don't survive, you get some data sometimes, but not all of the time. Um, and we came in and said, you know, we've got all of these years of experience, we're kind of riding along with the results coming from the WMO, let's give this a try. Uh, so we put in a proposal, NSF agreed, said, let's do this, let's see if we can do this. So we got a three-year proposal um, that started last fall, so we actually headed down last fall to Antarctica. This picture here was actually my first view of Antarctica. Uh, so we flew down uh, to New Zealand, hopped on a military aircraft, a C-17, and then from there actually flew down to McMurdo Station. Um, one of the other reasons that we wanted to go down there, um, it's more than just testing out to make sure that these correction factors and stuff that we've come up with um, are accurately working the way that we think they are and because uh, we think that the instruments are gonna work. There are worldwide impacts to some of the research that we're actually doing. Uh, because we don't have a good understanding of how much snow is actually falling in Antarctica, we're primarily relying on weather model output for that. Uh, there's really no weather stations down there that do this sort of thing. We don't know how much snow is actually being added to Antarctica. We have a pretty good idea of how much is actually melting off. And we've heard in the news recently about different ice sheets and stuff that are starting to break off in significantly large chunks from Antarctica and float away. So we have a good idea of what's being lost, but nobody really knows what the other side of that equation is. How much snow, how much precipitation is actually being added on the other side? So this is really one of the questions that we want to answer because if we know how much is actually falling in there, we can get better estimates of what we expect sea level rise to be in coming years with climate change. So some of the research objectives um, of our project was primarily to design a system that can distinguish falling snow from blowing snow. So as you can imagine, down in Antarctica, and this is on a good day, um, with the high winds and stuff, there's a lot of snow that just blows around down there. How do you make the distinction, is the snow falling or is the snow blowing? Uh, so we've come up with a suite of different sensors that we have deployed as part of our instrument package. So we've got our snow weight precipitation gauge. Uh, we've also got a snow height gauge, and this will give us the snow depth, um, or the amount of snow that actually accumulates on the ground next to our precipitation gauges. Uh, it's kind of a neat sensor. It's a sonic-based sensor, so it sound, sends out a sonic pulse down to the ground, and it simply measures the amount of time for the pulse to leave the sensor, hit the ground, and come back up. And as you take those observations frequently, you can see as the snow starts piling up that the signal returns to the sensor much more quickly. Uh, we've got a snowflake size sensor, um, of which I also have one here in front of the podium, just to give you an idea of the size of those. Uh, that's a laser-based sensor. So it emits a laser, and as snow is falling down, different precipitation particles, they'll fall through the laser beam. And this sensor is actually able to see how big those particles are. Uh, and it'll record, record those particle sizes. So one of our ideas is we hope to see that for blowing snow versus falling snow, uh, when those conditions are happening concurrently, that we'll see a distinct size distribution of the blowing snow particles versus a size distribution of the falling particles. And from that, we'll know how much of the falling particles are contributing to the to overall total accumulation that we're seeing in our instruments. We have a snowflake counter, uh, the one down on the lower left-hand side. 
Uh, that actually uses LED lights. So it's just looking to see particles that are falling through it, and it just counts them for a given amount of time. The primary reason that we integrated this sensor in is because we wanted to use this as a way to turn the other sensors on. And I'm going to get into the reasons for doing that here in just a minute. Uh, we also have a wind speed sensor, uh, our three cup anemometer, which obviously goes without saying. If we want to know if it's blowing, we need to know if the wind is blowing. And we have a webcam, which uh, works in both the visible and the infrared. So this time of year, the sun is getting lower and lower down at our sites. Uh, next month, we're going to lose sunlight completely. And at that point, the sites are going to be on their own to run through the winter on the battery power that we have them on. Which brings me to the second research objective, is that we had to design a system that operates on just three watts of power year round. So to give you an idea of how much three watts of power is, three watts of power is enough to power this light bulb for an entire year. So all of the sensors and stuff that you see up here in this picture have to be powered on this much power year round. This was something that we struggled with a little bit with the instrument manufacturers uh, when we were trying to spec these out, particularly with the precip gauges, because all of the instrument manufacturers wanted to sell us precipitation gauges with heaters on them. No. We cannot have heaters. Um, the original snow height sensor that we had was actually a laser-based sensor. And uh, we got it. We were getting ready to install it. And I kept having conversations with the manufacturer saying, there's no heaters on this, right? We can't run heaters on this. And I finally got to one of their engineers who said, well, you can't run the sensor without heaters, or the laser won't turn on. So then we had to send all the sensors back, and we had to switch over to the sonic-based uh, type of sensor. So it was tricky, um, but I think we ended up coming up with a design where we have these instruments. And like I said earlier, the snowflake counter instrument that we have, uh, that sensor along with wind speed and the precipitation gauge are actually on all of the time. We have the snowflake counter set up so that when it detects roughly 30 particles going through a minute, it will actually turn on the rest of the sensors. And we can actually start recording measurements from those. And that way, the other sensors aren't running during, during non-precipitation events, collecting data that's not really important to us, and chewing up the batteries. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Antarctica. Um, again, a lot of people are excited about Antarctica. They hear about it. They know it's at the bottom of the world. But not a lot of people have an appreciation for how big Antarctica actually is. Antarctica itself is about one and a half times the size of the lower 48. Uh, and this is to scale. So if you took the US and overlaid it on top of Antarctica, this is how big it is. Antarctica has 90% of the world's ice and 70% of the world's fresh water tied up in that ice. Uh, there was a recent study. It used to be estimated that Antarctica was covered by ice, or approximately 98% of Antarctica was covered by ice. The British Antarctic Survey actually came out uh, with some literature recently that said it's actually 99.82% of Antarctica that is covered by ice. A slight difference, minor difference. Uh, so to give you some perspective on where you're looking on this, um, over on the left-hand side, you can kind of see it right on the limb up there is South America. Um, and over on the, I'm sorry, that's on the left-hand side. Over on the right-hand side uh, would be New Zealand. Up near the top, uh, down a little bit from the top, is where the, the actual true South Pole is. Uh, the highest point in Antarctica um, is Vincent Massif, which is uh, somewhere over in this region over here. And then McMurdo Station, where we were based out of, is actually right off the map over on this side over here. Antarctica is actually kind of crowded, which is another thing that's surprising to some people. Uh, these are all of the countries that actually have stations down in Antarctica. Uh, all of the ones that are labeled in red are stations that are manned year-round, um, that have people there all of the time. The blue ones are the seasonal stations. They're typically only open in the summer. Orange ones are stations that used to be there that are closed. And yellow ones are proposed stations that may or may not end up um, happening. Uh, the US has three stations uh, that we maintain year-round. Uh, so you can see McMurdo down there on the bottom, which is the station that we were primarily based out of. Uh, Amundsen Scott is the South Pole station. So that is right at the South Pole. And then Palmer Station um, is a small station out on the Antarctic Peninsula. 
The National Science Foundation is the organization that is responsible for running those stations. Um, they manage what's called the US Antarctic Program. They roughly fund 100 or more research projects a year. And this isn't just atmospheric projects. This ranges from everything from astronomy to biology to meteorology to basically any type of research stuff that you can think of. Uh, there's 3,000 people, roughly, that travel between the US and Antarctica throughout the given Antarctic season. Uh, like I said, they have three stations. They have two dedicated ships um, that will go down there. One will go to Palmer Station. Uh, one typically goes to McMurdo Station. And they have lots and lots of different field camps, depending on the different projects and stuff that are going on. Uh, this year, they had the Shackleton Field Camp. Um, and they had all sorts of different research and stuff that was going on there. One of the more fascinating things that they were doing was actually digging dinosaur bones out of Antarctica. Uh, and they were getting ready to bring back some of the bones right before I left. So I wasn't able to see that. Um, but lots of really neat, cool science goes on down at Antarctica. Uh, so another question I commonly get when I say I've been to Antarctica is, did you see the polar bears? So I wanted to put this uh, slide in here to make some distinction about the Arctic versus the Antarctic. So the Arctic is at the North Pole. There's no land, minus Greenland. Uh, the ice is roughly 12 to 14 feet thick. There are no penguins, but the polar bears live there. Antarctica, on the other hand, has land. The ice is roughly 9,000 feet thick. Uh, there are no polar bears, but that is where the penguins live. Just so that we're all clear. I did not get eaten by a polar bear. We didn't have to take guns. There was no worrying about that. Uh, so how did we get there? Um, well, the actual route that we took was to fly from Denver to LA, LA to Auckland, New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand to Christchurch, and then Christchurch to McMurdo. Uh, so the US actually does all of its Antarctic research flights out of Christchurch, unless you're going to Palmer Station. And then you actually fly down to Chile in uh, South America, and you take a boat. Uh, a three-day boat ride across the strait there down to uh, Palmer Station. Uh, and those are the people that pray really hard that the oceans are going to be calm for that journey because it can be quite miserable, especially if you get seasick very easily. Uh, to put this in a little bit better perspective, um, just to see exactly how far we had to go, you can see Denver up there at the very top, right at the edge. Uh, the Christchurch Station is the one down here. Um, and then from Christchurch, you actually take the flight down to the very bottom. So it's actually a very large portion of the planet that you have to fly across to actually get down to Antarctica. But you can't just hop on the flight and go to Antarctica. There's lots of preparation that happens ahead of time. Um, over on the right-hand side, you can see the clothing distribution center. So one of the first things you have to do when you show up there is actually go get outfitted for everything. The National Science Foundation provides all of your uh, clothes except for your base layers. Uh, and they always warn you, no cotton. Cotton is bad because it holds moisture against your skin type of thing. Uh, but everything from there on out, uh, the overalls, the coats, uh, you'll see my coat laying down there on the bottom. Some of these things actually have names associated with them. Uh, the coat, everybody referred to as Big Red because it is a giant big red parka. Uh, and you could always tell uh, who the people were from the US because the US always had the red parkas. Uh, the New Zealand people have their base at Scott Base, which is right next to McMurdo. They were always in the orange coats. So it was easy to, to determine who was where. Um, boots, um, undercoats, hats, gloves, all of that stuff was provided uh, by NSF. So you go, you spend roughly two hours checking all of your gear out, trying everything on to make sure it fits. If it doesn't fit, you can see the line of people. So they're standing at the back. They were all in line to go switch things out uh, because things weren't fitting quite right. Uh, once you do that, you pack everything up, and you get ready to go. Um, one interesting thing was that everybody on their coat had their name um, right above the pocket. So as you're walking around, you can easily identify who the different people are. The picture on the upper left is where all of the aircraft are based in Christchurch um, that fly down to McMurdo. So you actually start right behind where I was taking the picture um, is where the clothing distribution center was. Um, and that is where the United States Antarctic uh, passenger terminal is. 
So the day of your departure, you show up to the passenger terminal, you go through, you get all of your clothes, uh, and you can see I had a ton of stuff. Uh, you actually have to get dressed in your clothes there in Christchurch. Now keep in mind, Christchurch on this day was actually 70 degrees. So you go in the building, you put on all of your base layers, and then you've got big red, you've got your big boots, you walk outside, you're kind of miserable, but you're kind of excited because you're going to Antarctica. So everybody lines up in line here. Um, the sign that you can kind of see there, um, just to the right of me, says ensure your ECW gear is not in your checked bags. So similar to other airplane, airplane uh, flights and stuff that you would take, you actually have to go through security, you have to check in for your flight, you have checked bags, and you have carry-on bags. So your ECW gear, or your extreme cold weather gear, is all of the gear that you have to be dressed in, and they don't want you to put it in your checked bags because as soon as you get off of the plane, it's not 70 degrees anymore. The upper right, uh, you can see one of the aircraft that we took. That was the C-130 aircraft. And to give you an idea of how fun, or maybe not how fun it is, to actually get to and from there, the picture on the bottom shows everybody packed in on the C-130. So there were roughly 40-some people um, that were on that flight. Um, it was literally sitting like this. Um, unfortunately, the C-130s don't fly as fast as the C-17s that they fly down there, because the C-17s are jet. The C-130s are actually t uh, turboprop airplanes. Um, and so that particular flight was an eight-hour flight of playing sardine. But it's all worth it, because you get down to the ice, and this is some video of my first steps out onto the ice. Uh, so we flew down on the C-17. We walked off, and the first thing you see is the Transantarctic Mountains. You can see Mount Discovery. And then as I pan around here, some rich person with their private jet was there. <laughs> and then we have, over here on the left, Mount Erebus. Uh, you can see the vehicle there, kind of off to the right. It was actually the vehicle that everybody loaded up into for the ride over to McMurdo Station. Uh, from the airfield here, it takes roughly about 45 minutes to get to McMurdo Station because you can only do about 25 miles an hour down the snow roads there. We did land on the ice shelf. We did not land on land uh, because all the land down there is actually hilly. It's volcanic. So they just groom the ice shelf for these aircraft to land on. Mount Erebus on the right, a lot of people don't know, is Earth's southernmost active volcano. And Mount Erebus actually put on a show for us several times while we were down there deploying some of our instruments. Uh, there are projects and stuff that they have going on up on Mount Erebus uh, where they'll fly helicopters up there and stuff. But instruments and stuff tend not to survive very long because Mount Erebus likes to throw lava bombs. Lava bombs the size of Volkswagen bugs. So you can put stuff up there, but chances are it's not going to stay there for very long. Um, after we get in the vehicle, we ride over to McMurdo Station. Um, the chalet that you see on the right is the first location that we go. And that is where we get all of our information, our welcome stuff. Um, uh, they give us our dorm rooms, because all of the housing down there is dorm rooms. Everybody has a roommate. Um, it, McMurdo itself is the largest Antarctic station. Um, before I left, there was upwards of roughly 1,000 people on station. So you can imagine the amount of resources and stuff they have to um, expend to support all of those people at this site. Uh, McMurdo is powered by diesel and wind generators. Um, it has one coffee shop. Um, it has three bars. It has a hospital. It has a firehouse um, and various other types of uh, things. It's got its own water treatment plant. It's got its own sewage treatment plant. So it's like a self-sustaining city that is fully supported by the National Science Foundation and the military. Once you get there, training, training, training. Lots and lots of training. The reason that people tend to be there for a while is because almost your entire first week is spent doing training. To give you an idea of the training and stuff that we had to go through, each one of these was anywhere from 30 minutes to four hours long. Uh, the ones that I want to uh, briefly touch on, uh, the light vehicle training, which just told you how to get around, what to do with the trucks, um, how to make sure that you kept them plugged in so that the fuel wouldn't freeze. Uh, the Antarctic field safety uh, was one of the more important ones. That was where they taught us if you're caught out in the field for some reason while you're out deploying instruments, the aircraft can't come pick you up. You need to know how to deploy your tent, and you need to know how to light the stove. Uh, 
since it was my first time down there, they had split us off into groups. I was the lucky one in my group that it, I was a first timer. I'd never done this before. So I was the one that got to start the stove. They kind of regretted that after they had me start the stove. But that is a reason that they have metal tables uh, where we do this stuff on. After we finally got through all the training, it, it came time to get ready to go out and do the actual installation. Uh, the, the picture on the left is our lab. You can see the precipitation gauges. We're getting everything hooked up. We're getting everything tested out. Uh, the picture over on the right is a lot of the equipment as we were unpacking it and getting things ready. Um, so I mentioned earlier we have several sites that we set up. We actually installed four different precipitation monitoring stations uh, near the McMurdo station. So you can see Ross Island, and McMurdo is actually on Ross Island. It's not technically on the continental um, Antarctic area. Uh, right next to McMurdo Station is Williams Field, um, and below that is Phoenix. Phoenix is actually where most of the uh, intercontinental aircraft land. Um, so that's where we first stepped off the aircraft. And then we have the Lorne and the Alexander Tall Tower sites. To give you an idea of distances, Alexander Tall Tower is roughly 100 miles from McMurdo. Lorne is roughly 50 miles. So we wanted to look at uh, the distribution of snowfall across time as well as across space when we set these uh, different sites up. How do we get the stuff out there? Well, you had to transport the equipment by a different, uh, several different ways. Willie and Phoenix, we could transport via truck. Uh, you just check the trucks out when they're available, put the equipment in, drive out there. Lauren, we had to fly out via helicopter. Um, and you can imagine the heart attack as I was having as this helicopter is flying away with $20,000 worth of instruments hanging, literally by a thread, from the bottom of the helicopter. Uh, the site on the, over on the right uh, was actually a helicopter coming in to land to pick us up once we were done deploying the site. Uh, Lauren was one of the last sites we set up. Uh, we set up Phoenix and Willie first so we could make sure that we knew what we were doing. Um, and those took us a little longer. The entire Lauren site, we were able to get everything installed in a day. Um, it took five helicopter flights to actually get everything out and back when we were doing that. Uh, but everything went flawlessly for that site. So how do we actually do these installations? Well, first off, we need power. Uh, so over on the left, you can see all of the batteries and stuff that were associated with each site. Um, three of the sites had 16 batteries. One of the sites had 22 batteries. These are car batteries, essentially, that we were installing. They're not light. I can personally attest to that because I lifted every single one of those into those bins. Uh, so you dig down. Uh, you put the uh, things in, put the batteries in, get those all hooked up. And then over on the right-hand side was one of the towers that we had uh, to set up for the instruments. And again, we had to dig down into the snow to set the tower in it. Um, it became kind of an ongoing joke amongst our group that we actually weren't scientists. We were professional diggers. So people would ask us what we did. We'd say, oh, we're professional diggers. And they would say, what does that mean? And we'd say, we go out and dig holes and fill them back in again. Uh, the idea was go out, dig the hole, put the tower in, fill it back in with snow to give it some stability. But just filling it in with snow was not enough to hold the tower. We also had to guy these towers down. Guying the towers down in the snow was also somewhat tricky. Um, so we had to come up with these giant wooden planks at the end of the guy wires. So you dig down into the snow, set these in uh, so that they were kind of at an angle to the tower, so that if the tower started to move, you've got a lot of surface area from these boards to keep it from moving. But again, that meant for every site, we had to dig two holes for the two towers and three holes for each guy wire for each tower. Then uh, came installing the instruments and stuff on the towers. Uh, so here's a site of some of the people uh, getting the stuff ready. You can see some of the sensors up. We're starting to wire things into our electronics box. Uh, and then we've got the shielding that we had to put up. Uh, now, keep in mind these instruments are on 10-foot towers. So getting the shields from this level up another 10 feet was a little bit tricky. Um, it took us a couple of tries at the Willie site until we got it down. But toward the end, we were actually able to get one of the uh, shields assembled roughly in about an hour and a half. Um, so it worked out fairly well. And then toward the end of the installation, one of the big things was making sure that the shields themselves were also guy wired down. So an additional set of four guy wires for each of those shields. In the end, we got all four sites installed. 
the Willie Field site was our premier site. So like I mentioned earlier, we want to check and see if that snowfall correction that was developed by WMO SPICE actually holds in the Antarctic environment. So at the Willie Field, we installed the DFIR and we installed two pluvio gauges in two different Belfort double altars. Um, and the reason we did the two is you can see the one on the right is actually sitting lower. It's at the same height as the DFIR and then the one over on the left is actually at our standard height. The reason that we put the ones on the 10-foot tower was primarily to address the blowing snow situation. Uh, the higher up you get it, the less likely you are that blowing snow along the ground is actually going to go into your gauge. So we wanted to go high, but not too high. Uh, Tall Tower was another site that we set up. This was the furthest one away. It's so-called Tall Tower because there's actually a 100-foot tower installed at this site um, with instruments at various different levels. Uh, we piggybacked at this site because they already had a bunch of other instruments there. Um, and we just kind of ran our stuff in a line. Uh, Lauren and Phoenix uh, were the other two sites that set up. I put one picture in here because they primarily look roughly the same. So we got everything set up, but then it became a matter of waiting for the data. You have to sit around, wait, make sure everything is uh, working correctly. So while you're waiting, it became time to explore McMurdo. See what sorts of things were actually around there. Uh, one of the things that we got to experience, um, actually, I didn't get to experience this, uh, but in the background, you see what's called Castle Rock. You can actually hike out to Castle Rock from McMurdo. Um, it's about a two and a half hour hike to get out there, and you can actually go up to the top of it. In order to get there, though, you have to walk across the glacier. Uh, so they actually have mountaineers that go out every spring that stake out a safe path for people to hike along so that you don't inadvertently fall in a crevasse. Uh, the things that the features and stuff that you see in front of there are pressure ridges. Uh, these are features that form in the ice shelf. So the ice shelf uh, along McMurdo, where we installed our instruments, is actually moving all of the time. And as it starts to brush up against land, it starts to get these waves in it because the ice shelf is trying to move, the land is not. And eventually, those ridges start to buckle and you get what's called pressure ridges, where the ice actually is forced upward. And you get all these different types of ice formations. Uh, the New Zealanders are the crazy ones who actually send mountaineers out along these rupture zones. And they also stake out paths that you can then go along and walk and take pictures of the pressure ridges themselves. Another thing we got to do was climb under the ice. Uh, so a lot of people get to see pictures and stuff of what Antarctica looks like from above. There were pro uh, projects that were funded down there where people were actually diving below the ice, which sounds kind of scary, sounds kind of a little sketchy. But actually, the divers that I talked to said this was the easiest dive of their life. Uh, the water is so cold, it's so stable, there's not a lot of currents and stuff, so they could kind of go diving and do essentially whatever they needed to do. Also, the water, if you think about it, it's water, it's liquid, its temperature is not going to be nearly as cold as the air temperature was around there. So your water temperature is a little below freezing and stuff. As long as they were in dry suits, they could actually go diving for roughly 40 minutes. Somebody came up with the idea of developing what's called the ob tube, or a tube that they could go out and drill a hole in the ice and sink the thing down in so that people could actually go underneath the ice and see what it looked like. It's a 15-foot tube, and you can get an idea of how small the tube actually is by um, the picture of me over there on the left. Um, not for claustrophobic people. The fire department actually has to do training exercises before they allow anyone to go in in case somebody gets stuck so they know how to get them back out. You're not allowed to wear Big Red down in the observation tube because usually with Big Red, it's too big for you to actually fit in the tube. So that gives you an idea of the small confined space that you're actually do dealing with. But once you go under the ice, this is what you see. Beautiful blue ocean. Um, if you're lucky, you can sometimes see penguins or seals coming by. Uh, you can see jellyfish. You can see fish. Uh, you'll see algae and plankton and stuff up on the bottom of the ice. Um, I borrowed a couple of pictures from my roommate at the time, Greg Neary. Uh, Greg was actually down there not as a scientist, but as a writer. Uh, so NSF, while it supports the scientists, it also has a program for artists and writers that people can apply to. Um, and you can go down and experience Antarctica um, and actually do a story on it. Some of the writers or some of the divers that were down there were actually diving down and drawing sketches of the underwater sea life that they were seeing on the sea floor. Um, so that's a picture of Greg from one of the divers inside the observation port. And then he had another diver take a picture as they were a little ways away so you can see the observation port hanging down below the sea ice. 
Um, probably one of the most unique things that I did down in McMurdo by far. Um, this was one of the neatest things down there. And because sound travels so well in the water, uh, you can hear the seals actually talking back and conversing with each other underneath the water. Uh, some of the other sites around McMurdo. Um, at first, this doesn't look terribly exciting. But if you look a little bit closer, you can see this mountain range here is actually mirrored. And you see the same thing over here and over here again. Uh, there were actually a lot of mirages that happened down in that area. So the air near the surface would get so cold, it could actually bend light. And you'd get these really cool reflections of things at the surface, right above the surface. Um, other sites of the pressure ridges, like I said, you can go out and actually take tours and stuff of the pressure ridges and see all the different types of ice formations. Um, and there's also the huts. Uh, this is Discovery Hut, which is right there next to McMurdo. Uh, you can walk out to it. You can see McMurdo over there on the right. This hut was built in 1902 um, by Scott when he landed in that area. Um, it's the original hut. There are two others like it in the area. Uh, the New Zealand uh, people have actually done a fantastic job of preserving these. Everything inside is essentially as it was back in the early 1900s when they left them there. So you go inside, there is food, there's the cots, the stove. Um, this particular one, I think, had a dead, dead penguin that they were dissecting um, before they left, um, laid out in there. Uh, but all of the original stuff from the early 1900s is in these sites. And it's pretty fascinating to go in and look and see some of the different instruments and stuff that they had in these areas. There was also the wildlife. Uh, so the primary wildlife that you see in these areas are seals, which we more famously called the sea slugs, because that's basically what they did, was just lay there on the ice. And of course, the penguins. I was not fortunate enough to see the penguins. We had one good snowstorm that came through while I was there um, that actually cleaned up the sea ice and prevented it from melting off. Because normally, as the sea ice starts melting off, as it gets closer to McMurdo, the penguins actually start coming into McMurdo. My roommate, Greg, on the other hand, because he was a writer, um, got to go out and visit some of the penguin colonies. So he snapped that picture. But we did have one errant penguin one day that came into McMurdo. <laughs> Greg actually took this video. Um, I borrowed it from him. So I'm going to play here. some audio here. You can hear Greg talking to him. Come on. He was up on the helicopter on. pad and got freaked hey. out when the helicopter spun up. Hey, come here. It's OK. Hey. So he stopped here until he okay. saw the helicopter get ready to take off. And you'll hear the okay. helicopter start to take off. And you'll see him look up at it. I'm not sure where he was going, but we nicknamed him Turbo. <laughs> Oops. Uh, oh, come on. There we go. Other things to do around McMurdo. Um, there's also lots of opportunity for socializing. Like I said, McMurdo had three bars. Uh, the coffee shop itself actually doubled as a coffee shop slash wine bar. So in the morning, you had the coffee shop, or what we called the Starbucks, or the McMurdo Starbucks. And then in the evening, it converted over to a wine bar. Uh, around Thanksgiving time, uh, people like to have a little bit of fun down there. They have their own turkey trot. But it's not your standard turkey trot. It's like a mix of the turkey trot meets Halloween, because everybody dressed up. Uh, you can see a seal over on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see a clown. You can see some of the people from the hospital. Uh, and I think this is a, actually a 5K race um, that they run. Um, down in the lower right is actually a view from the galley. Uh, so you have to feed the people while they're down there. Uh, the galley staff does an excellent job of making sure that everybody stays well fed. Uh, so you have meals three times a day, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, that they serve. But there is also food available 24-7. So for example, if you get the munchies at 11 o'clock at night, you can call over to the galley and say, I'd love to have a pizza. And they will make you a pizza. And you can walk over to the pizza and pick it up and take it back to your dorm room. Uh, they have um, 
recreation rooms and all of the dorms and stuff. Some of the dorms have saunas, uh, so if you get really cold, you can go in, warm up. Um, but lots of opportunity for people to interact down there. Um, oftentimes, the bars will host open mic nights. They invite people to come in and jam as part of bands and stuff. And it's really amazing some of the instruments and stuff that people manage to get in their luggage down to Antarctica. <laughs> Uh, one of the other cool things about uh, the Antarctica was every project had its own sticker. And this was actually a good way of getting people excited and knowledgeable about what you did. And it wasn't just the scientific projects that had stickers. Uh, the IT people had stickers. Uh, the one over there on the left um, is actually the scientific cargo group. Uh, they're the ones that handle all of the cargo coming to and from McMurdo. Uh, the one in the center is actually our sticker. and. Um, as an appreciation. I actually have stickers for anybody who is interested that I have printed out that are exactly the stickers that we handed out to all of the people that we interacted with down in McMurdo. Uh, so anybody who's interested, we have these for you after the talk. Um, so all of these cool things, go out, talk to the different groups. This is kind of my collection of stickers. I had a few others in there. I'm hoping to pick up more when I go back this fall. Uh, but then it came time to actually go back and say, OK, We've been having some fun and stuff. We've got to look at data. We've got to see how our sites and stuff are doing. Here's an example of some of the initial data that we're, that we're getting from one of the sites. Um, this is from the Willie Field site. This is from the beginning of this month. Um, so this is brand new data. I haven't even really had a chance to sit down and dig through it too much. Uh, but you can see this is accumulation. Um, I put this one in inches for you guys instead of millimeters like the last one. Um, and again, we're, this is the liquid water uh, measurement. This isn't snow depth. So for this particular event, we ended up with almost 0.2 inches of liquid water. Uh, McMurdo's actually been having an unusually snowy summer season. Uh, it's not common that you see events like this. But the unique thing that we're getting out of this data, and I had kind of anticipated it, but not to the degree that we're actually seeing in the data, you notice that we get the accumulation event and then the line starts to fall off after that. That's actually precipitation sublimating out. So sublimation is the process where water goes from an ice directly to a vapor. It bypasses the melting phase. So now we're actually getting an idea of not only how much snow is falling down there, but how much is actually disappearing into the air itself. Um, and this is one cool thing about the project. We did not put into the proposal. Uh, we did not say we were actually setting out to measure, but it is one thing that we probably will, will end up reporting on in the end. Because again, there have been estimates of how much snow is sublimating off down there, but nobody has actually really measured this before. Um, so for this given event, it took almost two weeks for that 0.2 inches of snow to disappear um, off of that area. Uh, a little bit of discussion on some future work. It's a three-year project, like I said. Um, so we're going down two more times. We've got one more trip planned for this fall, which will be kind of a maintenance type of trip. Uh, make sure everything's working, fix any problems. If things blow away in the wind this upcoming winter, we'll have to be prepared to fix that, uh, put things back. And then tentatively, the plan is to remove all of the sites in 2019 for the end of the project. Uh, we are hoping that if we get some good data from this, we can write a follow-on proposal to NSF to keep this work going and put more precipitation gauges out across more of the continent and really start getting a good idea of how much precipitation is actually falling in Antarctica. Um, of course, analyze the data. Um, that's going to be one of our primary things. Um, I've been excited looking at some of the data we're getting in from some of these sites. We can definitely see when we're getting precipitation events. Uh, we haven't had any really good windy events yet, so I know at this point what we're getting actually is accumulation. And the plan uh, up this upcoming summer is to bring a student in to help me out and do comparisons of what the weather models are showing uh, for, that, for those given events to what we were actually measuring and see how well are the weather models doing down there? And come up, can we come up with some preliminary corrections to them? Uh, a couple of things that I put on there. Uh, I do maintain a blog while I am down in Antarctica. So if anybody is interested in following along on my adventures when I go back down this fall, uh, please feel free to subscribe to that. You can go back and read through everything that we did this past fall. I've got a lot more pictures and stuff in there as well, uh, a lot more discussion and details on some of the things that we did. And I also put a link up here to uh, USAP if anybody is interested themselves in going down to Antarctica, um, either as an artist or writer, or if you want to go down as some of the help uh, to keep things running at some of the different sites, either seasonally uh, or as a year-round type of thing, if you go to this site, you'll see a jobs and opportunities section, and you can read what the requirements and stuff are for all of the different positions. 
And with that, I've got a few more pictures that I will let run here for you guys to enjoy. Uh, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. And we do have.